This tomato is one of about 100 I've grown from this garden behind my house. Doing so makes me wonder, what if everyone grew their own food? Is that even possible? What kind of environmental impact would it have if everyone supplied at least part of their own food? On this episode of Scientific Drinking, we're asking that exact question. I'm wondering how much of a carbon footprint could be reduced by growing some of your own food? How much money can you save? Cheers. Yeah, so one thing I forgot to mention in the previous episode is the little flossers, you know? Little things that you stick between your teeth, they come in the plastic hook. I hate those. I hate them. Not because of the flossing. Those things are so damn wasteful. Like, you're gonna floss, right? And you can get this, the wax-covered floss strings in mint flavor if you want, in little cardboard boxes. The actual waste generated from a roll of floss in a, in a cardboard box is pretty low. But you have those little floss sticks, right? You get them in a big plastic bag. You have all this plastic handle that goes into it. And you only, you only use it for a couple seconds. All right, hey guys, and welcome to Scientific Drinking. Episode, God, what are we on now? This is 15, 16, 17. Episode 17. Now, you might be asking, why isn't he toasting me with a beer? Well, because that last beer you saw at the intro, I finished it, and now, well, I'm out of beer. Yeah, it's been a sad day. So. As I mentioned, today's topic is food waste. For those of you uninitiated in today's apocalyptic predictions, food waste is kind of a big deal. 161 to 212 billion dollars of food waste every year. And if you're less interested by the economic impact and more interested in the practical matters, that's 30 to 40% of food wasted every year. Cheers. Man, that's a terrible thing to toast to, isn't it? So there was this article that popped up a while back and it was repeated over and over again. You know how these things get out of hand these days that said that the average meal travels 1,500 miles, which is utterly ridiculous. Really, the economics of that would be unfathomable. <laughs> unfathomable. But there is a little bit of truth to that. So if you live in Chicago, then certain foods can travel up to 1,500 miles to get to your plate, especially if they're coming from, say, New Zealand. But in reality, a lot of the food we get travels a lot shorter average distance. Another study in 1997 estimated that food travels about 1,129 miles. Let's lowball the estimate and say that your food travels on average about 1,000 miles to get to your plate. That by itself may be a little bit of an overestimation, but that doesn't mean that every single meal you eat travels 1,000 miles to get there. Of course, you don't just put one meal on a truck and deliver it, you deliver it in bulk. So it's the food itself delivered in bulk traveling these long distances. But we can use the statistic to get some estimation on how much fuel is used to deliver the food that you eat every day. How much fuel is wasted delivering food that just kind of goes to waste or is thrown out by supermarkets. Now there's a lot of reasons that they do that and we'll get to that in a little bit, but let's just generalize a little bit just to get an idea of what kind of carbon footprint this wasted food may have. Now that 161 to 212 billion dollars corresponds to about 60.3 billion kilograms of food, which is astonishing. It's kind of hard to imagine that much, right? But let's break it down a little bit. So you have the 60.3 billion kilograms of food. The average semi-truck or lorry might be able to deliver about 16,000 kilograms of food. Now, if we assumed all of these semi-trucks or lorries were fully loaded, we can divide the amount of wasted food by the number of trucks it would be required to deliver them, and you get about 3.8 million trucks. Each truck gets about six and a half miles per gallon. If they're traveling about a thousand miles to get there, now I know I'm using miles instead of kilograms, but that's what the information was formatted in, and so that's what I'm delivering it. I know, I know, I hate not using metric too. Makes me sad. <laughs> so 3.8 million trucks divided by 6.5 miles per gallon times 1,000 miles gives you about 585 million gallons a year. Now each of those gallons of fuel produces about 13.3 Kilograms of CO2, I know I'm swapping units back and forth all over the place, but really, bear with me here. That's 5.9 million kilograms, billion, billion. That's 5.9 billion kilograms of CO2 every year produced by food that we just don't eat. Assuming that all the food is going on semis and all of it is taking the lowest average amount of transportation and assuming all the food is being moved on 6.5 miles per gallon lorries across the United States. Now it's not that simple because about 20% of food is just never loaded onto trucks because it was too small, too big, too wonky looking, just 
they don't think it would look nice on the shelf, so it's left to rot. Multiply that by 80% and actually take off another 4% because 4% of food is just never harvested. It's grown in fields, but just never collected. So that doesn't really get loaded onto the truck. So multiply our 5.9 billion kilograms of CO2 by a coefficient of 0.76 or 76%, and you're still left with about 4.5 billion kilograms of CO2. Two sides to every coin now. That sounds like a lot, and it is. It's a lot of CO2. Now the atmosphere in its totality is about five pentillion kilograms of CO2, a truly incomprehensible number. Now about 0.04% of the atmosphere is CO2, and so you're still left with two quadrillion kilograms of CO2 in the atmosphere. So adding one millionth of that every year, which is about the impact of these lorries, uh, doesn't seem like a lot. Now, it's not the lorries themselves that are the big climate impactor here. Of course, adding this up over time and doing it every year is gonna make a difference. But the real impact from wasted food comes from beef. Now, assuming that 30% of wasted food is indeed beef, which might not be fair, but let's just assume that for now and use lowball numbers that maybe will work out. So let's assume that 30% of beef that is made is wasted. Wasted, just like the driving skills of anyone who drives a CRV. Now, the average American eats about 100 pounds of beef a year, so that's about 50 kilograms. Multiply that by the number of Americans, 300 million. Lowball estimate, and you're getting about 119 billion. Billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions. Kilograms of CO2 every year just wasted from beef alone. Now, beef isn't the only uh, generator of carbon. I mean, all meats generate carbon and waste in the atmosphere. So it's kind of strange to think that despite all the miles this food travels, the biggest form of waste in the form of carbon or pollution, it actually comes from the beef. Now in all this, I'm using about 30%, which is the lowball estimate for food waste. It's anywhere between 30 and 40%, depending on who you ask and how you measure it. So this leads us to the next question. Why aren't supermarkets doing anything about it, right? If you have all this waste, why are you ordering so much? It seems like you're wasting money, just like you're wasting food itself. But there are many reasons why supermarkets don't control this kind of waste. <coughs> God damn, I love sake. So let's get into some of those reasons right now. Reason number one is that if a supermarket isn't generating waste, it might be a sign that they're running out of supplies and not tending to their customers' needs well enough. Basically, if you go into a supermarket and you don't have the item that you want, you're going to be a little bit upset and more inclined to shop at another supermarket. And that's something that supermarkets want to avoid. So they overstock the shelves, show that they have plenty and make sure they're tending to customers' needs. It's better as a business model to throw away food instead of customers. The second reason is kind of piggybacking on that one, overstock displays. Customers like to see large stacks of pristine foods. At least that's what supermarkets think. So these supermarkets want to keep their shelves as stocked as possible to draw a customer's attention and sell more food. Number three is cosmetic perfection. Now I hinted to this earlier when we were doing the math about the carbon footprint. 20% of food is just thrown out because it's not shaped right. It's too big, it's too small. I mean, who's gonna buy the small pieces of, of fruit, right? And, or the big ones, they don't stack correctly and just throw off the displays. If the fruit, vegetables, and whatever food you have doesn't fit within this nice mold of what you'd expect it to look like, customers just by their very nature are gonna be less inclined to buy it, especially if it has little defects on it. So supermarkets choose to stock food that looks perfect rather than taking on the ones that don't for the same reason that we talked about before. It's just customers might not buy them. And that's a shame. In fact, there's a company that's kind of taking this on by force. And if you're into this kind of thing, you might have even seen their ads on social media recently. They're called Misfit Markets. And I've started participating in that as well. And we'll talk about that in the very end of the episode. The next one is sell-by dates. And this is a little bit tricky. The FDA mandates that you have some kind of sell-by date on a lot of your food just for the interest of food safety. But it's not quite that simple. It's not that the food is going bad. It's that it is past its prime. Now, something that's past its prime doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be thrown away. A lot of the food that is past its sell-by date is still good, good for a long time. But leaving that on the shelf would cause customers to be disinclined to purchase that because it's like, oh, look, it's past the sell-by date. It's not gonna be good. Or they think it's gonna be in their fridge for a while and maybe it'll go bad, which might be legitimate arguments to a certain point. But supermarkets are kind of taking it to an extreme and labeling these somewhat arbitrary sell-by dates to the point where it's becoming a real problem. Now, the final point is unpopular items. If something stops selling really well, supermarkets might just 
throw them away. Make room for newer stock that will sell better. They can make more money by selling that new stock uh, and in fact make up for the cost of throwing away the food that is less popular. So now to the final part of the episode, we ask ourselves, well, what can we really do about it? Most of us don't own a supermarket. And even if we did, these are some pretty compelling reasons as to why the food waste problem is a reality. Well, there are several things we can do. First of all, you can buy local. There's a lot of farmer's markets available pretty much anywhere in the United States and indeed internationally that might be a better option simply because it doesn't travel as much. But as we know, the biggest impact on climate change uh, isn't really the travel time for the food, but the beef itself. So eating less meat is actually better for the climate than buying local by itself by actually two orders of magnitude, it's huge. Now the second one, take it a step even further, is gardening. Now I mentioned that in the intro, I have a little bit of a garden, and I've done some math to find out how much work goes into maintaining the garden, what's the hourly rate. If I was to get paid back by the amount of money I save, how much would I be making by farming in the garden? And I've compared it to someone who does much larger scale, we're talking about 3,000 square foot. Now this is just one example, but it seemed to fit my math pretty well. So if you're someone who knows a lot about farming or about home gardening, leave a comment below, give me some estimates. Um, but it's kind of funny how this math, math worked out and I'll tell you why. The family in question, link below, is a group that gardens on about 3,000 square foot. It's a long stretch of land and they spend about eight and a half hours a week doing so. Now adjusting for their kids helping them, they estimate that optimally they would spend about seven hours per week gardening. And they save approximately $2,400 a year by the food that they grow. Now that sounds like a lot, but dividing the amount of money they save by the amount of time they spend in the garden, they actually save about $6.57 an hour by gardening at home. Now, of course, there are other benefits to doing this, such as reducing your carbon footprint and indeed kind of eliminating it in that aspect. So to quantify this only in uh, economic terms is a little bit disingenuous, but we're gonna keep rolling ahead by this because it's a convenient metric. Now, I, on the other hand, have a very humble garden. It's very small. It produces some cherry tomatoes, uh, some Thai chilies, some seasonings, some spices. But on average, this garden has about one to two hours of labor put into it every week. Now, based on an estimate of about $500 a year, which was kind of thrown together, it's a wild ass guess, but you'd take uh, some of the spices and herbs that we grow, they can be a little bit expensive, and then you have the cherry tomatoes, the chilies, some of the basil, and hopefully some avocados coming in pretty soon. That's, uh, it saves a significant amount of money over the course of the year. Divide that by the amount of time we put into the garden, and we end up about $6.40 an hour which is pretty similar to the amount that was saved by gardening that 3,000 square foot garden, much, much bigger than what we have here. So it's interesting to see that's the amount that you consistently save by growing your own garden. So and the last thing I wanted to mention was this Misfits Market thing, the thing I've been doing. Now what Misfits Market ends up doing is just kind of giving you a lot of the Misfits. You know, the food I mentioned earlier that was too big, too small, weird shaped, but the downside of the Misfit Markets is you get kind of some unusual stuff. And I've kind of just set it to the default option, so you never know what you're gonna get. This, I'm pretty sure is a beet. And then this, I think is a butternut squash. Also not 100% sure. I've never really cooked with one. And this, well, I don't really know what this is. So I know I'm doing something to save the environment, and I've had some ex you know, interesting experiences cooking with this stuff. Like seriously, what even is this? I have no idea what I'm doing with this. And had some pretty good results. And you know, I'm kind of the guy who's kind of curious. I like to learn. So it's it's good for me to kind of step out of my comfort zone and try some new foods. That being said, it is a challenge. And if you're not up for a challenge, if you're not someone who likes to cook, then this really isn't gonna help you that much. I really don't know what I'm gonna do with this. That's pretty, so this could be used as a home defense weapon, I'm pretty sure. Pretty solid bludgeon. This would knock a man out, I'm serious. This would, this would do some damage. Come on, give me all your money. <laughs> this is really stupid. Hmm. All right, so that's about it. Thanks for watching. You know, we, we talked about food waste today, determined that meat is a much more significant contributor to uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Even considering that your food might travel on average a thousand miles, CO2 is two orders of magnitude more uh, devastating when it comes from cows alone. And that's not considering other 
sources of meat. That's just beef. We also determined that the average cost of gardening uh, might save you about $6.50 an hour. Maybe a little more, maybe my math is wrong. Hey, let me know in the comments. I've been known to have been wrong before, a lot. So thanks for watching this episode of Scientific Drinking. Tune in next time on the third episode on our series on waste when we talk about the pollution of the brewing industry. Should be an interesting topic. Cheers. Ya, mine san, konba wa. Scientific drinking e yokuso. Anato wa jibun jishin ni tazunete iru kamo shiremasen. Naze kare ga nihongo hanashite iru no? Dakara, o sake nomemasu yo. Oishii ne.